crucified. Philippians tells us that he humbled himself to what? The death of the cross. Are we connecting the dots? Before the, the foundation of the world, Christ was intended. Christ came to earth knowing fully well what would happen. Right. John, when he sees him, says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ in the garden, let's connect that, says, If it's possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will. Again, it's not, it's not hurry come up. It's not just thought about. It's not, it's not a hasty decision. This has been in train before the let us statement is made in Genesis. Let us. Before all of that, this was in place. Yes, to say, we are going to do this. And this is how man will be reconciled. So, when Andrew says, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. It's not a simple statement. How many of us use our GPS? Oftentimes we have no idea where we're going. <laughs> I can tell you this, that for my job, I drive to some places. Woo, I'm up in the hills of, of, of Vermont. <laughs> and I'm worried for other reasons, but yeah. one yeah. of the reasons yeah. that I yeah. don't know where I'm going. Uh -huh. <laughs> but the GPS says, turn left. <laughs> turn left. Look for the sign, turn onto this road to say, oh, that's the road. And you get, you turn up at the place. We have found him. There are some identifying marks. There are some signs which we can look to for us to identify who Jesus is. Right. And so when, John, when, when Andrew says that, it says, despite what we knew, the law, the prophets, all that information that has shaped our history and our culture, we have found him. Because in that information that has shaped us is that Moses said, look, there is going to be a prophet. Isaiah says, there is going to be a child born of a virgin. His name will be Emmanuel. So we have Malachi tells us, all the prophets are saying, there is a time coming. And then as we get to Matthew chapter 2, we have some wise men, the Bible calls them, saying, we have seen his star. I mean, think about it. You have how many millions of stars in the sky? They said, we have seen his star. Again, some identifying marks. Um, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12 is the second one I'm begging somebody to read. 1 Peter chapter 1. 10 to 12. Because again, when, Jaz, when, when John makes a statement, behold the Lamb of God, is a powerful statement. It's a, it's a departure. It is a rethinking of all that we think salvation is, or they thought salvation was. Because John says, behold the Lamb of God. So, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired in them. Searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have not the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. So if if if, if I'm understanding this passage right, the prophets, though they got the information that there is a salvation coming. Search, delete, what manner of time? How will this be done? You know the part that strikes me? It says at some point even angels mm. didn't know. Yes. So when, when Andrew says, we have found him, I, I want for us to recognize that 
That is a statement that is an all important statement Andrew is making that based on all the information I have, based on all I know, based on the fact that I was following John the Baptist for so long, I am at a point now where I realize that all else, everything else is secondary to this moment. God is among us. We have found him. Everything else was leading up to this moment. We have found him. <coughs> when I read that, you know, you tremble a little because you said, I said, to, have, I, have, I, have I uncovered? Have I discovered? Have I accepted? Have I found Jesus Christ? In the kind of a way that says, all the systems, the great systems before, really don't matter. I think it's Paul who writes, it says he has counted everything before as dumb compared to Jesus Christ. So when John is writing to emphasize to us the deity, the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, this is one passage that should work our mind some thought that Andrew, in one statement, in one moment, no great philosophizing, no great um, education, no study, no great arguments, no great debates. John says, behold the Lamb of God. And Andrew can put it together, all that information, all his history. And it's going to come back from all the way from Abraham down to say, we have found him. Not that, not that Andrew didn't just say in, his, say in himself, oh, that's good, we have found him. No, it says Andrew left and found his brother. So convinced that, look, we have found him. John, have you succeeded in beginning for us to turn the mind to say, wow, Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That's a question for you. But once we look at all of that that we have done, I'm hoping that you will start to see how could John, a Nazarite from the womb, sent as a messenger before God, revered as a prophet throughout all of the, the, the community, the Jewish community, feared by the government at the time because of his moral standing and what he was preaching. How could John Summarize all of the Old Testament authority by saying, Behold the Lamb of God. Certainly he wasn't ignorant. So that information led him to the conclusion, Behold the Lamb of God. So that we looked through last week. Good, 10 minutes. Any questions? We want to jump into two and three. Comments, concerns, or oh, you're still working on it. All right, all right. I just start calling names after. So we're looking. These are the the, the, the themes I want to look through in two and three. Oh, I'm trigger happy finger. So, looking at Cana Galilee cleansing of the temple, Nicodemus famous story. Most people know it. Comes to Jesus by night, and of course we look at the witness of John the Baptist. But let's start. Cana of Galilee. 2 to 11 says, Jesus Christ and his mother and his disciples went to a wedding feast in Cana. And they went, the pivotal problem was that they ran out of wine. His mother said to the people, the attendants, said to him, they have no wine. Jesus says, why are you telling me this is not my business? My time is not yet come. His mother like I think most mothers says to the attendant, just do what he tells you to do. Jesus says, fill the purification jars with water. They fill it, they dip in its wine. He says, take it to the host of the feast. The comment is, why have you kept the good wine until the end? And that is what we have in a nutshell, Cana of Galilee. But one of the things as we read, I want to put in our minds the process making wine. In that time, if I'm reading right, 
they would grow the grapes for how long? You would prune, you would tend to the, 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 the I'm f forgetting the name that grapes. The vine, but the whole field. But you tend to it, the vineyard. The vineyard. You tend to the vineyard, you reap the grapes, you would trot the grapes on the foot, and from it to squeeze the wine, and of course, some a little aging happens, or it will be fresh wine. So that's a creative process. Now, again, bring your minds back to the time. This is how likely wine was made. So here comes Jesus. Um, he says to the attendants, fill the water pot with water. They dip in, they get wine. You're sitting there in the audience. Would you expect wine? Seriously. No. Remember, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Right. The wedding feast typically runs some probably five, seven, ten days. The guy who tastes the wine, the host says, you have kept back the good wine until the end. If we are to imagine that there are a couple of days that pass and this wine is now being introduced, Jesus Christ, you have just surpassed a whole process and created the best wine. Think for a moment that convert is not just the, to make wine is not just the water. When the, when the, the vine is making wine, it's not just water. It pulls from the earth, the source, air, all sort of chemical and biological processes that makes this wine. Right. And not just any vintage, real good wine. Jesus Christ says, and we get to it in John chapter 15, I am the vine. I am the vine. And when we get to John 15, we talk more about that. You are the branches. But the idea I want to bring for us is that when Christ says, I am, I am all sufficient, I am all able, I am able to do whatever you need. Jesus Christ had, he didn't even have at this point all the disciples, all the apostles. They just heard from John, behold the Lamb of God. They believed John. In my own mind, they didn't believe Jesus so much then. It's because John said so. You know, you are heading somewhere and somebody you trust say, that is a good thing. But you haven't developed any faith in that thing yet. Right, right. But because the person you trust, their opinion, their, their, you know, their whole character says to you, I, you can be trusted, friend for 30, 40 years, whatever, they are an expert you trust. Amen. But you haven't developed any of that yet. So there the disciples come to the wedding. Imagine. Put yourself in that shoes. You're in that wedding. John says this is the Messiah. The evidence points to, yeah, this has got to be the guy. But you have no tangible hands on. You haven't touched the evidence yet for your own self. These apostles now see some 120 to probably 180 gallons of water turn into wine. The guy who tastes the wine, we are gonna we are gonna imagine that he's an he's probably not an expert, but certainly knows good wine. So you are sitting in that beside Jesus, and Jesus looks at you simply and he says, fill the pot with water. If he's anything like, if that demeanor was anything like a, a Dave McKenzie, <laughs> he probably didn't even look at you. He just said, fill the pot with water. <laughs> and he says, all right, now, take some and take it to the host. Can you imagine how many of us 
would walk with confidence taking that water to the host. <laughs> it's not until the host says, wait, you guys have done the opposite of the tradition. That I'm thinking that those guys are going to say, wow, it's really wine. In a couple of moments, put yourself in the apostle, in, in Andrew's space. Andrew, all your life you have been reading, there is coming a Messiah. Moses, the revered lawgiver, says, there is coming a prophet after me, him you will listen to. Isaiah is telling you, hey, listen, a virgin is going to conceive, bring a son, call his name Emmanuel, he'll take the sins of the world. Malachi says a messenger will come. All of that is in Andrew's head playing. Then the messenger comes, John the Baptist, and Andrew is a follower, learning from John the Baptist. And John, who the scriptures spoke about, the prophets, says, Andrew, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Andrew says, all right, John, I trust you. I believe you. If you say so, then yes, this must be the Messiah. So Andrew begins to follow Jesus Christ. But I'm imagining that Andrew is saying, like most of us, we are humankind. If you say so. I have confidence, trust, and reliance in the law and the prophets. I know that. That is, that is what I have known all my life. I have confidence and trust and reliance in you, John the Baptist. You have been prophesied about. You are here. You are doing what the prophecy says. But I don't know this guy. But imagine now, with all of that, I step in and Jesus, at the wave of a hand or a few words, creates gallons mm. of wine. It must boggle the mind. This has got to be the guy. This is the first miracle. We haven't gotten anywhere yet. This is the first of them. Uh, just a point on the, um, the comment on the, the good wine. Um, the good wine was always considered to be the one that was unadulterated, um, there was no yeast in it, so it was non-alcoholic. That was the good wine. And what, <laughs> what, what it did, I think you alluded to it in, in just now, the tradition was y you, give y you gave your guests a little bit of the good wine at first, and then you gave them adulterated wine because the taste buds <laughs> are already compromised. Mm. So they would get the bad wine <laughs> afterwards. They say bad wine in that the, the, the one that would intoxicate you. But the f at the very first, they gave you the good wine, the one that is a non-intoxicant. All right. All right um, we read some more of that. I, I, I take the point because it says, I think the, 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 the speaker said, you gave them the good wine and when men are drunk. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is that the best wine at that point was not given in the traditional way. What is interesting too is that the entire audience, and remember now, if I'm understanding this right, the wedding in, in, at the, in those communities wasn't the selected few that you invited. It's likely that majority of the community will be out. What we read is that at first it is the apostles and the attendants who really know what happened. The general audience didn't know. But can you imagine being exposed to such a miracle? How long would it take you? to spread that. But the important point I want for us to get is that the apostles' belief were being cemented in Jesus Christ, beginning now. Another point is that 
why are there purification jars at this place? Obviously, this venue has some religious significance. Jesus Christ, why would you use the folks' purica purification jars to make wine? Wouldn't these be sacred? And you have now created wine in the sacred jars for a secular event? Does it turn your mind? But if Jesus Christ, sorry. Um, you're mentioning how this is the first miracle and it's the breaking of tradition of get saving the best wine for last. Um, it brings to mind for me that Jesus is coming to break the old covenant and establish a new one and it is better and sending a sign to everybody that what he is establishing is better than what you know before. I agree with you Amen. that if we if we go back to the statement grace the law came by Moses but but there is a changing of direction and it is at this point that we are going to see as we read through we are going to see a number of things happen you know, Jesus Christ doing some things on the Sabbath um, that just irks the rest of the Jewish community. How could you do this on this day? And Jesus says, I don't know if it's this account, I need to read it, but it says, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. We have him here demonstrating that, hey, I am the master of all creative and natural processes. And when we get further down to six, we look at him calming the seas, the storm. Jesus Christ is Lord over all of that, both the, 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 the agricultural process and the natural or climatic processes. Jesus Christ is Lord over all. And so, Christ, are you saying here that this ceremonial setup doesn't matter? Not at this point. Jesus Christ is not yet crucified. But Jesus Christ has begun to demonstrate his superiority over everything current up to this point. Everything you know, everything you believe in, everything you have established, Jesus Christ is a departure and different from that. I suggest to us, put ourselves back to when we became Christian. I'm talking about like that three hours before your baptism and probably about two hours after, if so long. When nothing mattered to you but your Christianity. I mean, you, you were on fire. <laughs> nothing else. You have come to the realization of who <coughs> Jesus Christ is. Thank you, Lord. And I'm putting it at two hours. The devil has not found a way to Give tempt you out of it or reduce it yet. Come on now. <laughs> or just think about times in our lives when you, you have missed the mark. You, you right. drop off the track a little or oh, much. And that reality, that, that hammer hits you like, <coughs> are you crazy? <laughs> and you take that grip, that renewed grip, that firm grip, and say, nope. And I'm soldiering back. Yes, sir. <laughs> it is that moment when Jesus Christ takes precedence, mastery over all that we know and accept. You think I'm lying? I'm going to use my own example because you people are much better than I am. <laughs> but oftentimes, a challenge hits you. Mm. And you start working, well, I start working it out. And then the reality comes home that 
Yeah, you, you, you think you know finance. You think you know some amount of, of, of maintenance. You think you know these things. But if Jesus Christ doesn't say so, that's right. Hello. <laughs> don't make any sense. I'm going to give you one personal example. We owed a debt, and we began to work on how we're going to pay this debt. Yes, sir. A good money. Really begin to work out how we're going to pay this thing. And then I open the email and I see the mail from the guy. And I say, okay, here we go. <laughs> but before I did that, I went online to the account that I had, opened it up. And good thing that nobody else saw me because you might be look <laughs> coming to visit me <laughs> in the nut house because I'm just laughing. And all I can say is, God, you, you, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The statement says, zero. All right, all right. I'm not lying to you, zero. All right, all right. Sent an email to the guy and I said, I got a statement saying zero. I'm just making sure. <laughs> that is it. He says, you're all good. You're all set. Wow. That didn't happen 10, 15 years ago. It happened just recently. I'm saying that if I tell you how much calculations I did, Oh, mm -hmm. all that we think we Ooh. know, and this is my personal issue, you know, you, you can work, all that we think we know, mm. and we know a lot, don't discount that, we, we know a lot, yeah. Yeah. but Paul says, and I like Paul saying, he says, I count all of that as worthless, dumb, unnecessary, mm. when it comes, when it compares, when it is held up against Jesus Christ. That is because Paul recognized who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. John is writing to us, his audience, and to us by extension, that we understand who Jesus is. So let's come quickly. Three points. One, up to this point, the law and the prophets were respected, revered, and trusted. John introduces to us a departure. He says, but grace and truth mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Three, the people who understood that best because they were in that environment could safely, confidently say, we have found him. Hence now, when they come into this setup, it's a confirming or a reaffirming or a cementing of that belief. So, in the story of John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, we have a feast that run some five, seven or more days. Large numbers. In this that we have, some of these folks were disciples of John, Andrew for certain. <coughs> were there, sitting. And so we have this wine, this water being converted to wine. And of course, the first miracle Definitely, word is going to spread. But so be it. This is the first miracle. Question? Comment? Is there anybody who is concerned that Jesus Christ decided to be a part of this festivity. Any thoughts that come to mind? Jesus, you're heading to a wedding. Here is a whole village of people celebrating love, union, family structure. Anybody? I do have one question because I'm not really familiar with this, this, this talk. So Jesus at this time, is he like a, oh, I'm sorry. Is he a young child or like a mid teenager, middle age? What age range would Jesus he have been to have d started doing his miracles at that time? Jesus should be somewhere in his 30s. Mm -hmm. 
And if I'm wrong, then I'll see hands go up and somebody will tell me otherwise. You mentioned earlier about thinking about the mixing of sacred and secular. And I, what comes to mind is before the word was only for the Israelites, and he's extending it to everybody, so mixing the sacred of secular, so giving access to all to know him. All right. Um, that's a good point. Um, what brings to mind, and I always like to give you the verses when I say this, but there is a passage that speaks to um, Galilee of the Gentiles. And I'll, if you remind me, I'll, I'll share it, just to give an idea that, hey, here is a community, Jewish then, but that would become Galilee of the Gentiles. It was a prophecy, actually, that was being spoken of. So you're right that, you know, Jesus Christ is moving the spectrum wider out. And as we get into John, John 3, 16, you read some more of that. Whoever, all right? When I, when I read this, I, there was a couple of thoughts that came to mind. Um, the person, his mother was there, and his mother was the one that came to him and said, hey, folks ran out of wine. He almost, it almost seemed like he was apprehensive. My time has not yet come in verse 4. Like, I don't want this to be my first one where I show the people. But his mama knew he was special. So I always, I, I think about that and how us as parents, we, we see something special in our children. I just had a bunch of thoughts when I, when I read through that. Yeah, um, yeah, you bring thoughts in my head because there are some passages that we read in the early life of Mary and the early life when Christ was born that she, she took note of some other things, saying that not only was she knowledgeable about the scriptures, but she could identify some of the things and would say, take note of them. So yeah, um, just the way she said, do whatever he says, is it tells us that Mary's spirituality, Mary's understanding of scripture, and of course she's his mother. Um, if Jesus Christ is the, is the example in all form, then as a good child, is an example for us as well. So respect for your parents. Um, one translation says woman, which is not, which is, I, which is speaking to her respectfully. As if he's saying, if how I interpret it is, mom, I'm not, this is not my time, I'm not ready. But you know what, you're my mother, you know. And, she, and she, there was no discussion to say, all right, would you like to? She just said, look, whatever he says, do it. So, yeah. I think um, for me, I think what Brother Norville added to the conversation about the good wine and yeah. understanding, because before I thought that, I think people stay away from the story sometimes because it seems like he's promoting the drinking of alcohol in the secular environment. Let's make more wine for the people, et cetera. But... It en encourages me to sort of look into the, the process and this miracle and what it really was. Um, because if the wine was actually the good wine that didn't contain, it was in its purest form and didn't intoxicate people, then I could see why his mother would say, make wine knowing that her son would give the best. And it wouldn't be something that would lead to... Um, drunkery or whatever when you associate a wedding and, and partying and that kind of stuff. Um, but that adds a different dynamic to the story that I didn't think about before. And it's encouraging to sort of understand what that wine process was and, and, and why they used it and all of, the, all of those components of it. Because it, it's, it just adds a different dynamic to the story that I didn't think about before. Yeah. And we can add to that that um, the Christian is not to be intoxicated with anything, not just wine, not love, not money, not, right. you're always to be sober, mm -hmm. always to be balanced. Yeah. Um, all right, so, we good? Okay. So then, um, 
keep blending three questions. I keep putting it in the form here. John says, these things are written that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the whole purpose of this book. So far, we have the prophet saying, this is the Son of God. We have John the Baptist saying, this is the Son of God. We have the apostles or the disciples at that point saying, hey, we have found him that we read about. This is the Son of God. Let's run to another one. So Nicodemus comes on the scene. And this Nicodemus says, no, we have to pause. Who is this Nicodemus? Nicodemus is described as a Pharisee. One of the things we know about the Pharisee is that these folks knew the law. They were the doctors of the law. Some of them were scribes. So they, they, it's not, Nicodemus wasn't coming from a head knowledge, an opinionated point about Jesus Christ. He didn't, he was just a part of the society. You know, some of us grew up as Christians. We grew up in a Christian household or we grew up around Christian people. That's all we know. And it means that, yeah, we, 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 we have exposure, but we haven't studied anything really. But your mama, your aunts, your, so you grew up listening, hearing it. You had to go to church whether you want to or not, so it's in you. You sing the songs without the hymn book just because you have heard them so many times. Mm -hmm. But you have never really considered the words. The word, yeah. You know, when, when, when they sing Old Rugged Cross is just another song, and if... If you grew up in some city, you know when they sing that is about to have communion. So you know, okay, we are at the communion part. Even if you wake up, you realize that, okay, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, but it's, the significance is not there. But Nicodemus was a doctor of the law. Would have studied it, would have known the dictates, have been practicing it. Um, I've appeared a Pharisee, a learned man in Jewish religion killed in the interpretation and application of the Mosaic law. This is the Nicodemus that comes. Of course, he comes by night, and we are all familiar with the story. We know why. I mean, as a ruler, if Jesus Christ is against all things Mosaic, you can't come in the day. You know, you're not supposed to. It begs the question, though, you know, it begs the question of us. Can you go to Jesus Christ in daylight? When we sit in a setting where Jesus Christ is made to be of least or less important or even negatively criticized, Do we at that point, when light is on the matter, begs an interruption and say, may I introduce some other information about Jesus Christ in this discussion? Could I be given a chance to balance the argument? May I share some new information? Have you considered the fact that Jesus Christ Respectfully, I don't agree that Christianity is a crutch that the poor lean on. Mm. Or do we wait until night when we're among those we are comfortable with? Or the one or two people who really have no effect on the discussion or the minds of the people who said the original information? Do we wait then when we can disguise and safeguard our personal pride, property, importance mm -hmm. to then attempt to identify the greatness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus, if you have the opportunity, you sit in the seat of influence, you are a ruler over people who are living in darkness because you identify that the Jesus Christ you're talking to 
could not do what he is doing except God be with him. Not a God, not some God, <coughs> not some greatness, but except God, the God, be with him. You claim to believe that in the night. You have all that influence. But you choose the night. Before we kill Nicodemus, before we kill Nicodemus, do I defend Jesus Christ in the daylight? When light is on the matter? Question. But Nicodemus, a ruler in Israel, again, a doctor of the law. You know, I have to bring in another doctor of the law, Gamaliel. I think it's Luke chapter 5. Gamaliel says about the apostles and preaching the gospel. In the midst of the Sanhedrin, in the list of rulers, he says, we must be careful. And this is why light is on the matter. While the discussion is active. While everybody's mind is paying attention. He says, we need to be careful how we treat these men lest we be found to be fighting against God. Don't know if the conviction went much more than that. But I'm bringing that out to make two points. That we're talking about the people who have studied the history. We're going to get to a point where, and we have gotten to a point, 1045, that they... Ruler said, Abraham, we have never been in bondage. Abraham is our father. We're going to get to a point where the temple, they can identify the building of the temple. I'm bringing these points up because the ordinary Jew, Israelite, could tell you about his history. Back from Abraham. Imagine a doctor of the law. And we're going to end with this, that the doctor of the law came to him by night. Say, I know. How do you know Nicodemus? Because I followed the identifying mark that everybody else did. And I've come to the point that you must be. Jesus Christ said some things in John chapter 3, verse 3 to 5. We're going to close on that, ask you to read that. And then we'll talk more about that next week. <coughs> But the question I want to leave with you to consider is the evidence from the marriage of Cana pulling you any closer to saying, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let us pray. Great God and Father, we are mesmerized each time we dive into your word, how much information you have left, how much road signs you have left for us to follow. How awesome and great you are. We pray, Father, that you'll help us always to respect, to reverence you for who you are and to strive for God to be pleasing. Forgive us, we ask. Be with us as we move to the next portion of worship. As we pray to Christ's name, amen.